What started on the drawing board became a trophy. Engineers at Federal Premium Ammunition designed the trophy-bonded tip bullet to deliver devastating bone-crushing performance. With a translucent polymer tip and boat tail design, Trophy Tip provides flatter trajectories and improved accuracy. Plus, a solid copper shank jacket and bonded core mean high weight retention and deep penetration. Trophy Bonded Tip from Federal Premium Ammunition. Claim your trophy. From the Deer and Deer Hunting Headquarters here in Iowa, Wisconsin, Welcome once again to Deer Talk Now. We're back in the saddle. I'm Dan Schmidt along with Brad Rux. Brad, welcome back from a week in Kansas. Kansas. Yeah, we were doing the early muzzleloader season and uh, the weather just really did not cooperate. It had been steadily warm, which you would expect, and all of a sudden a cold front moved in, tons of rain, thunderstorms, and, and really the deer just kind of got into a little bit of a funk because the, the, we we're hunt, hunting with uh, extreme management hunts and it's a great spot and they had daytime photos of these bucks you know at least four-year-olds and I'd hunt that spot and we'd literally not see anything you know and then we'd go to a different spot and kind of the same thing was going on and literally one night there was a magical night it would have been last week Thursday um, we saw a ton of deer a ton of bucks were on their feet I just didn't see the right one one of the other hunters in camp saw a beautiful 140 class 5x5 five five that was just a little bit out of range and one of the neighbors killed a 176, just an absolute Big stud. Giant yeah, giant. We're going to have that on the website, and uh, we're actually going to talk a little bit more about your hunt in particular and some of the things that went into it. Early season muzzleloader, transition period with deer. A lot of questions came in over the past, well, over the weekend, we got a ton of questions. Facebook, Twitter, uh, Pinterest, Google+, and our um, Deer Talk email address. But I want to remind everybody, go to Facebook. Just log right on there, Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine. You can ask a question right there. Some people were asking me last week, how do I ask a question? Just throw it right up there. Put it on our board. Send it to an IM on Facebook. However you want to do it, if you want to just post it, we're going to try to get to it. We're cataloging, cataloging all these questions. And we're going to try to get to them this fall. And we're going to open up the prize vault here in a minute. Oh, nice. Um, we have tons of prizes. Brad and I have been cleaning out our, our offices here, and we have boxes and boxes of goodies. And we're going to give everybody something who we answer their question on air. We have six questions we're going to get to today at least. <clears throat> Some really good ones. And it's everything from, like I said, from transition period, everything that's going on now, a little bit of gear related and that type of thing. Uh, the one thing I want to start with is the Shop Deer Hunting Special of the week is, we've been doing this, Brad, we've been trying to find the best products in each category. Now we have the Mama Call, which is a great call for early season and as you get into the closer to the rut but we also were looking for a really good grunt call to pair with that and we think we found it here with the dual game calls stretch back uh, buck runner call you got to check this out we have it up there at shop deer and you're going to get an extra 10 percent off of that call today or this week if you just enter deer talk in the checkout box an extra 10 percent off you're going to get that call for Right around 20 bucks, a couple dollars more, but it's a really good grunt call. It's a, it's a double chamber call, which is it's a really high quality grunt call. So I want everybody to check that out. We also have the Viking Quick Hoist. You got to check those out. If, if you're like me and you're on the run and you shoot a deer on somebody else's property and you have no place to hang it up, really cool little product. Basically, you strap this to a tree. It's got a hoist. It's got a, a winch and a ratchet. And you can crank, it, crank your deer nice. up right there if you want to skin it in the field or if you just want to hang it overnight uh, you can do that in the woods you can strap that on the tree just check it out right there chop deer the viking quick hoist is also on sale this week let's get to the questions brad because we have a lot of them uh the first one is talking we're talking about gear and we're talking about you've shot expandables for a long time yeah basically you know when they first started coming out uh, i kind of switched i still shoot some fixed blades but you know, when that Rage 2 blade came out, you know, I just fell in love with that. Now, thing. you're shooting those when it was Sniper. Oh, yeah, with the old Snipers. Yeah, ab absolutely. And and Gators, actually. It was Gators without the retaining clip. Bruce Berry's design. Yeah, Bruce Berry. And, and, you know, I, I fell in love with it. And the one thing I noticed from shooting expandables in the past, you know, they always had that big bloodshot area. I mean, and with the old type, it would be this big. And I would just look at that going, man, all that energy. You know, I'm losing all that energy. 
And yeah, I was getting pass-throughs yet. And then when Bruce came out with that concept with the the blades are actually facing outward, the sharp side. They just pulled uh, back. Yeah, you know, that big spot went to a small spot. And, and literally I knew more of that energy was going through. And, and the blood trails were insane. And the tracking distance was very short. So, I mean, that's why I fell in love with it. A couple it. quick points because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a point and then I'm going to bring up our question, which somebody sent in on Facebook. But... This is really interesting. The guy's name is Andy Peterson, and he is a big quality deer management uh, guy. He came out with a study. Now, this is the closest thing to uh -huh. something scientific that I could put my fingers on. But he did a study from 1989 to 2012 with over 1,300 cases of deer shot with bow and arrow. This is going to blow your mind. Recovery rates on archery shot deer on average was 82%. Which now this is deer that were shot that were actually recovered. So you know you hear all this nonsense from the antis on how bow hunters shoot more deer than they recover. That's that's complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I would off air I would use a more stronger <laughs> term than that. But 82% um, of all the guys that are shooting deer with archery equipment are finding those deer. And what I'll say is the actual loss is so minuscule because uh, one thing that I'll stand by is there's a lot of people that get into bow hunting. Who just aren't good blood trailers mm -hmm. who shoot that deer that deer runs off they just didn't find it yeah and it's not that they didn't kill it but here's an interesting point in that study two things number one deer shot with expandable broadheads 91 percent recovery rate amazing the average of all of them was 82 percent deer shot with expandables was 91 percent and i credit a lot to the, the designs like you're talking about the big cutting uh the, the, almost three inches on a Rage uh, Extreme, uh, two inches on a lot of the other ones. New Archery Products makes a great uh, expandable. There's a lot of good ones out there. That's number one. Number two, the recovery rate for crossbow hunters, 96% wow. using expandables. So crossbow hunters using expandables, almost 100% recovery. So that should tell you something. Mechanicals are definitely here to stay. But the question that we got in from Facebook was... Um, he asks, I'd like to shoot expandables, but I don't know if my bow is set at a high enough poundage. I shoot about 55 pounds. Uh, should I be using expandables, and, or should I be looking for the ones that des specifically designed for lower draw weights? What do, you, what do you have to say, Brad? You know, I think 55 pounds, especially with the energy that these bows are delivering now, is more than enough. You know, and you look at some of the big names, Mark Drury still shooting the, the Rages. And he's shooting that type of poundage, and he's getting complete pass-throughs. Remember, you know, the thing with expandables, it's all about shot placement. Right. You know, and you're shooting, mm -hmm. you know, rather than fixed blades that might plane if your bow's not tuned perfectly, the expandables, if your bow's not tuned, is going to hit right where your field trip is. So you should be able to hit that spot. And if you can, you know, you're going to be very successful because you're not going through major bone. I agree with you, and it's a great point that you make is that um, the, the modern compound has come such a long ways as far as what's 54 pounds now isn't really the same as what was 54 pounds then. And the design on these heads, and I used this a million times, and we're going to just humor me, we're going to do it again. This is the new Rage crossbow broadhead, scary sharp. Bob Rob taught me that term. He says, if your broadhead doesn't scare you, it's not sharp enough. Brad, you're going to hold that. And this is as simple as it gets. <clears throat> I'm going to take a rubber band. I'm going to make it taut. And our, just because you got a brand new thing of broadheads doesn't mean it's sharp. And what we're going to do is I should be able to put this rubber band on that blade. That's a sharp broadhead. Yeah, just snap straight away. Now, if I take a rubber band, I'm going to do this again. If I take a rubber band and I have to put, apply any pressure to that blade, that broadhead is dull. And some people, and I take a little Smith sharpener and I'll sharpen those blades. And some people, oh, you're going to ruin the factory finish. I'm like, I don't care, the broadhead's dull. I, I'm not going to hunt with a, a dull broadhead. So we're going to do this again. Just keep a bunch of these rubber bands in your pack. Take them to camp with you and show everybody that you should be able to take that rubber band, barely touch the blade, and it breaks. And that's a sharp broadhead. And that rubber band will, this represents a deer's artery. A deer's artery is like a rubber band. It's, it's pliable. So if you have a dull broadhead, what I call dull broadheads, and that's not snapping this immediately, that's where you see that bloodshot meat because that broadhead is actually pushing past that artery and not cutting it. And all that energy is being it's trauma to, mm -hmm. the, to the area, to the muscle, to the meat and whatnot, and that's what causes it. But it's a great question. 
Um, it's one we run across a lot, but I, I shoot 54 pounds now. And I've been shooting the Rage Extremes. I shot the uh, that doe I shot last weekend. I shot with the new Rage Core. It went 50 yards. These deer are not going very far because you're putting big holes in them and you're cutting and you're causing that. It, it's all about hammer drill. You know, the one thing I want to plug since you brought it up, you know, when you're talking about broadhead sharpness, when this broadhead's in my quiver for a year, you know, it, it, the blades kind of get oxidized. So yep. they'll actually dull. So I think a lot of times a guy pulls out his quiver from last year and is like, oh, yeah, I never oh, shot any of these. New, they're yeah. going to be fine. They're brand new. Well, they're, really, they're not. They're dull. And the other thing is it's just, okay, so you go hunting, you take this out of the quiver, you put, put it back, back in. in the quiver. You take it out of the quiver. It doesn't take much. Mm -hmm. And like I said, just a little Smith sharpener, a couple a couple swaths in there. You can get, I've, I've actually reused these. I know they don't want me to promote that, but I've <laughs> reused broadheads where I've just resharpened the, the blades. Great question. Uh, thanks to whoever sent that and we're going to get a hold of you and you're going to get your prize pack from DDH. Brad, next one. Uh, next question Kim comes from Twitter. Uh, do you guys leave your cameras up all season? I have a couple trail cameras placed where I can access them quickly and easily during the season. Should I be leaving these out for long periods of time or not? You know, my opinion, yes, you can leave them a long time. They're all rubber sealed, they're gaskets. I'm not saying occasionally one of those little plugs doesn't fall out and you get ants in it or something that could ruin it, but today's cameras are built very, very good. I leave mine out year round. Why? You know, I, I like getting photos of late season when the bucks are still have their antlers. Uh, I, it tells me when they drop their antlers so I know I can start shed antler hunting. So if I have pictures of a ton of bucks, after the season ends, when about 80% of those have dropped and I'm not, I'm getting one or two buck pitchers on a card rather than, you know, a hundred pitchers, that means I can go out and look for shed antlers. So I'm not wasting my time, you know, wandering around. I just think it gives me a good feel of what the deer are doing year round on my property if I have the cameras out year round. I agree with you. I, you know, I've had that little stealth cam out there since spring and that thing is just, it performs like a champ. Now those batteries, They've been really making these things. Those batteries are lasting for months, which is amazing because used to they chew up through batteries. Cameras would chew through batteries in no time. In a month, I mean, in, you'd in be putting new ones on. But yeah. I've had, I think I've changed the batteries on. I think maybe twice, maybe twice. I don't even. I think maybe once, and that's almost. We're going on like seven months that they have those cameras out. But I agree with you. It's really cool not only to see deer, but you can see. What else you got? You got turkeys, turkeys you got coyotes, other coming around. Whatever's yes. going on, it's a great way to sense us. Bobcats got a picture of a big bobcat again this year, you know. So it, it is definitely fun. We still have the Cahaba River camera on yours, mm -hmm. and uh, we're getting some great pictures with that too. Our video. So if you guys want to check that out, it's on the homepage. That's the live uh, video feed of the Cahaba River camera. So check those out. All right, Brad. Let's get to the next question. So we had one Facebook, one Twitter. We're going back to Facebook. Uh, we're going to just take this one right away because I know you want to answer this one. We talked about you were hunting in Kansas. I was in North Dakota, and we both saw it. The transition from summer behavior to autumn behavior, snap your fingers, it almost just happened this, that fast. Uh, and they're asking, they keep hearing about this transition. Uh, how would you describe it, and how does this affect your behavior? Well, the biggest thing is, you know, when you have them, especially when they're in velvet yet, you know, you're seeing big groups of buck, big bachelor groups. You can have, you know, as few as two or three, but you can have 10, 11, 12 bucks together. And it seems like at the day that those things start shedding velvet, and most of them shed velvet relatively quick little period of time, they start breaking up because we were hunting and literally we we're on a bachelor group of six bucks and the smallest is a 133. I mean, it was, he is probably the smallest, 133 to 135. They broke up the day before you know, we got there and all those bucks were either in singles or doubles now in different parts of that farm. They're no longer even coming out to the same food source. And I think that's just a frustration for a lot of, uh, a lot of hunters because what you have going on is not only do you have that, but up here you have the acorns that are dropping. So you got now, now you mix in some additional food sources that you know, they've been hitting an alfalfa field religiously all summer long. Well, now you throw into that in the mix with that breakup, and sometimes it gets hard to get on a deer for a little while. Oh, absolutely. We saw that. My buddy Corey Johnson, we've been out hunting on his, and he's got the probably picture-perfect imperial whitetail clover plot that I've ever seen. I mean, it's, it's almost weed-free. It's perfect. You're looking at it. It looks, I said, did you come in here with a lawnmower? And he said, no, that was the deer. I mean, they, they got it mowed off, but they're still hitting it. But I said, you know, we've been sitting, sitting, not seeing any deer. 
And I said, I bet you they're on acorns. Acorns. Because those white oak acorns started dropping all, about a week and a half ago. And now the red oaks are dropping, and there's some nice plump acorns on the ground. And I don't care what you have. When deer start hitting acorns, it's going to be like somebody turned off the lights for a little while. It's either going to be hunting the acorns or you're going to be waiting for them to transition back to uh, some of these other foods. But the other thing that I saw, we talked about this a little bit in North Dakota, is like you said, they were hitting um, alfalfa. And uh, the alfalfa there was just awesome. Hitting, hitting, hitting. Three days before we show up, boom. Boom. Chris said, you know, uh, I think they're off of that and they're on the soybeans. And they were just, they transitioned back to soybeans because they were still green. And I think they're, I don't know if they instinctively know something there, but they, was, and it was just like you said, flip a switch and things change. So you really got to have some alternative planning here. Yeah, the other thing that you notice as soon as it gets cold and daylight starts to get shortened and falls here is those whitetails really start gravitating more towards early morning and late evening. Because um, running trailer cameras, I mean, we're, we just pulled one of the cards, and this just reminded me that that camera had been in since early August. And we're looking at photos of this one eight that one of the boys wants to shoot. And we had photos of him going out to the alfalfa field at 5.30 in the afternoon, religiously. A as it gets closer to now, I mean, right now he's coming out between 6.30 and 7. Still legal, but he's pushed that back by an entire hour from where he was coming out. Why is that? I, I really don't know. I mean, it's it's yeah. just one of those deals. And that's how it normally is. You know, you if you have those year pattern, you better have you better have it figured out. You better have stands with the right wind direction. We found that out because the wind has been crazy here as switching far as direction. It's switched. We've had everything from south to north and everything in between within the past four or five days. So you get out there and say, oh, this is a great spot for anything. You know, south, west, even northwest wind. Well, also now it's out of the east or if it's out of the northeast, and you find out quickly, early season, I'm going to push that. Even if I got my ozonics unit with me, all it takes is one molecule, and that, especially if you're hunting a uh, bigger, older deer, and you're not going to see that deer. You're not, his patterns just switched instantly. Now, the one beauty part of this year is if you start getting a picture of two bucks and they're hard horn, normally those bucks are going to stick together this time of year, so you get a chance of shooting them. Uh, last night we sat over an alfalfa field and it was quite a ways out and, and we watched 12 bucks come out the alfalfa. Wow. All from different spots, but they're still in that little bit of sparring. So uh, we watched them fight for almost half an hour before it got too dark. So cool. it's definitely fun. Awesome, awesome. We're plowing through these. Couple more to get to, Brad. I'm going to take the next one because this is, uh, as you'd say, one of my dear geek questions that came through. Another Facebook question. Uh, what causes, we had posted a photo, and if you guys haven't seen it, go to the Facebook page, Deer and Deer Hunting Facebook page, but a guy in Minnesota shot this ginormous, if that's a word, uh, velvet-clad buck. This buck just happened, not, had not shed his velvet yet. It thing's got to be, I can't remember, it's 190 maybe. It's, it's just a giant. Got to see the picture, but it's really cool. Shot with bow and arrow. But they brought up the question about cactus bucks, and we see these every year. And what do I mean by a cactus buck? These are the deer that you see that have these big globs of velvet antlers and um, misshapen, some almost grotesque looking, but normally these giant racks. Now, one thing that we've, we've had uh, regularly in the magazine over the years is the difference between uh, velvet antlered bucks and velvet antlered does. If you see an antler doe, a lot of times what people say is an antler doe is not an antler doe. If it has peeled velvet, it's not an antler doe. Uh, a lot of weird things going on there. It's usually hermaphrodite, which means both male and female genitalia. And the male genitalia, you're not going to be able to see. It's undescended testes, but I'm going to get all geeky on you <laughs> if I bore you guys to tears explaining that. If you want to read about it, you can read about it in the magazine. Um, but these cactus deer, normally that's a hormonal thing. Um, normally that it could be a hermaphrodite, it could be a buck that got his business injured and he just is not, doesn't have enough testosterone to shed his velvet, but normally that's what you see when you see a velvet uh, cactus buck. Um, it's just a, it's a buck and he's probably going to shed those antlers at some point, but it's going to be a lot different than a normal deer. Antler does, different situation, much smaller racks, almost always velvet and usually it's just small little globs of velvet. They just have enough testosterone in their system to grow it and it never sheds yeah. and a lot of times those will freeze off and things like that but that's uh 
that's uh, my short take on that. Uh, the, the cactus bucks, weird looking things, but uh, normally there's some kind of injury going on to that animal. Brad, next question is for you and about muzzleloading, and it's quite convenient seeing, seeing you just got back from early season muzzleloader hunt. Uh, this guy wants to know some suggestions for better accuracy with his muzzleloader, and he wants to know the differences between shooting a muzzleloader in warm weather versus cold weather. Well, it, it's definitely going to make a difference. You know, we, we just got the new CDA in the office like three days before I left, so I actually went through the process of sighting it in. First thing, get yourself a quality scope. If you can hunt with a scope, you know, use a quality scope. It's, 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 Specifically, if you can get a muzzleloader scope, because a lot of times these are, you know, designed just for muzzleloader. Hawk makes a good Hawk one. A good Nikon one. has a good one. But you know, use that, sight that scope in. You know, we started off. I started off at 25 yards. Get yourself a big enough piece of paper. Remember, at 25 yards, you know, one click is no longer a quarter inch. One one click is a fourth of a quarter inch. Mm -hmm. So if it's off, dial it in close, and then go out to 100 yards. If you're going to shoot distances, I recommend practicing at those distances. So if you're going to take a 200 muzzleloader shot, you better practice that out at the range, and that's going to take a lot more time and effort. Now, if you're sighting that muzzleloader in this time of year, it's great if you're doing an early season hunt like we're just in Kansas. Would, would I use that muzzleloader again come December when a lot of them are going in? No, I'm going to go back out to the range. I'm going to shoot that again at 100 yards and dial it in because it's probably going to throw it a little bit different. Just the, the, the barrel heats up differently and it's going to throw your lead out a little bit Repellent different. Repellent ignition is a lot different. Than All of it, yes. What were you using for loads in this? Uh, for this I time? was using the, the new uh, um, CVA uh, 250 grain bullet. I can't think of what it's the called. Power belt. Yeah, the power belt. Um, they look cool, but then I was using 150 grains of powder before and I was using the, the, the power pellets. I was using uh, 777. And that's before I heard you tell, you know, Chad said that you really don't need that much. Yeah, you really don't. A uh, hundred grains is all you need. And, um, uh, you know, you, a lot of guys like shooting three pellets. They, they get into that and it does add a little bit of kick. But depending upon your ignition, um, you're not going to get a full burn on that third pellet. So um, what I always recommend to guys is use two pellets, plenty enough for what most guys are use, or shooting. Now, if you're a long accuracy geek, please write to me and tell me how I'm wrong. But um, for the average guy, 100 grains, I would say two pellets or 100 grains of loose powder. Um, the loose powder I've actually found is a lot more efficient. And I found my accuracy because I'm not a, uh, a muzzleloading geek by any st stretch of imagination. I like to shoot just because it's an extra season to get to go hunting, but I don't have enough range time to sit there and play with all these loads. But 150 yards, 100 grains, um, you know, but the loose powder I found is more consistent out of my CBA that I shoot. But some people have better success with, with what they're doing. But if you do have some tips, we'd like to hear them because we like to share them with all the other Deer Talk uh, viewers. But that's some great advice, especially your advice on making sure you recite that rifle in. Because if you're doing it now in September or October, um, just the temperature variances, the, the pressure variances, how that's igniting the powder, that's going to be different. It, when it come November and December when it's cold out or, or humid, um, you might find your accuracy is completely different. different than what it was in the early season. All right, Brad, we got time for one more question. That went by pretty quick, didn't yeah. it? Uh, one more question here, and it's going to be... Oh, this is almost a Facebook flush here. Uh, another Facebook question. I live in a state with liberal doe populations and regulations. My buddies and I have an ongoing debate. They say it's not a good idea to shoot does in food plots, and I say it doesn't matter if you do it, if you don't do it often. I know we both have different opinions. I'm going to let you go first. What do you think about that? You, you know, I thought it was going to go, should you shoot a doe in early season or not? And, and you know, my opinion yes. is shoot it anytime yes. you can. Yes. Now, it really depends on the situation. If, if I'm in one of my food plots that is really close to the bedding area, no, we're not going to yep. shoot a doe out of that. If I'm on bigger destination plots, which for me means, you know, I'm competing against the egg fields, I'm going to go ahead and shoot that doe out there. I, I don't really care. Now, I do have a specific time when I like to shoot them. I don't like to shoot, uh, shoot them at night. I like to shoot them in the mornings because normally that deer is not going to get very far back into the woods. I'm not pushing any deer, where if I shoot it at night, 
you know, and say it's not the best hit. I don't want to be going through all through my woods at night. So I normally try to shoot my does in the morning it's, this I, time of year. Actually, I agree with just about everything you said there. I, I agree 100%. Uh, any doe that's in range is a good doe to <laughs> shoot, uh, especially if you have management that you need to do. Um, and you need to take, if you need to take does off your property, that's one thing you have to figure out first are, are we going to take off does? And you really should have a plan. Are we number one? Number two, how many? And number three, when, it really doesn't, like I said, it doesn't matter. Um, early season is the best time to take out some of those older ones because they are really, really hard to hunt. And I found that out again uh, last week. You know, it just takes one molecule of scent and that old doe is just as smart as an old buck. Oh, yeah. But um, interesting point, you talk about shooting them in the mornings. Because I wind up shooting most of mine in the afternoons. But it's the same thing as like try to hunt areas that, okay, probably are not going to kill a buck out of this spot. Yes. Just for whatever reason. And it's far enough away from the bedding area. Like early season and you want to be buck hunting, you don't want to be killing those does near a bedding area or where they're going to run up and muck things up if you have a buck pattern. But you probably, if you have any type of land with any kind of topography to it, that there's going to be spots where it's like, you know, we could kill a doe or two early here and not mess things up for later. And I've seen that. Actually, I've seen both sides where guys put in a plan like that. And then I've seen other plans where guys say, I'm just going to shoot the first doe that comes out. I don't care. Shot it, and they shot a buck the next day or Which the next week. Which is fine. Week. Yes. Um, and a lot of times those deer are curious if you drag a deer out of there. So, I mean, there are, there are uh, cases to me being on both ends. But uh, if you wait too long... With anything, with especially management um, uh, agendas, if you wait, oh, we're going to do it during gun season or the last week in the gun season. Well, good luck because now you got buck fawns that are almost eight months old that a lot of times are hard to identify, and they're getting a thicker winter coat. Or you you want to go out and you want to shoot some older does, and they're just they're just very difficult to hunt after the season's been going on for a couple months. Plus, if you want the venison, go ahead and take one. I mm -hmm. mean, and utilize your best judgment to where you should shoot it or shouldn't shoot it. You know, let's face it, if you make a good shot, that deer's not going to go very far yep. anyway. We just set up our farm specifically for a few areas where we like to take those out. Why? I'm lazy, so if they shoot it and they make a good shot, I can drive it up to it with an ATV and, and pull it out. You know what I mean? So it's not like we have to drag it 250 yards or anything else. So those are all factors for me personally. But we got to keep in mind that you and I are spoiled. We live here in the Midwest, mm -hmm. and if I pass up a doe tonight, I'm going to get another shot at one tomorrow. You know what I mean? We have so many. We have the luxury of having so many deer around where some of the people across the country aren't in that and, same And mode. that's actually, I'm going to circle back to this question because we did address it uh, directly, and I'll try to do that. Basically, the question was, should you shoot them in a food plot? And I, I'd say it depends. You know, it, it depends on, it, okay, if you're using, if that's a small food plot, if it's not a destination food plot, if it's one of these kill plots we talk about, and you're trying to buck hunt, maybe not. Maybe not right away. Maybe you're going to wait a little bit. Uh, I think the, the thinking there a lot of times is with southern hunters, especially those, some of those food plots get pressured so heavily that, yes, if you go run out there opening week, second week, even into the third week of archery season, and you're just hammering does out of those, those kill plots, it's going to make that food plot really hard to hunt. Mm -hmm. But um, if you say, hey, we need to take two does out of here, I want to take one right away opening weekend, and he's, you know, my buddy's going to take one, then you can do it. I think you can plan it, especially if you have a rhyme or reason to it where you're saying, we're only going to do it in the mornings because most of the rest of the deer, especially the bucks, have already, already cleared off that field. You're waiting for a really good shot. I'm going to wait for a nice quartering away shot, mm -hmm. a nice broadside shot close, where it's not going to get very far. Then... To answer that question, I would say it really doesn't matter. Yeah. So that's it for this week. Thank you, everyone, for all those great questions. Those were some really good questions, I thought. We're going to keep compiling these, so please keep bringing them to us. Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine's Facebook page, um, our, our Google Plus page, Twitter, it's at Deer Hunting Mag. Um, email me. We can flash that up there, dan.schmidt at fwmedia.com. I don't care how you get a hold of us. Ask us the questions. We answer them. You're going to get a prize from Deer and Deer Hunting. And until next week, he's Brad Rucks. I'm Dan Schmidt. Thank you for joining us for Deer Talk Now.